headline. John the hippie is in the desert smoking weed. Now, I editorialized the story for the modern year. John the Baptist was not a hippie and was not smoking weed. However, the headline is directed as to what is going on in the desert. John was preaching a message that was anti-establishment. John's vision of the future and the kingdom were very different from what was being spoken by the religious leaders of his day. John was partaking, John was partaking in activity that although not illegal, was off-putting to many, not understandable, and not accepted in polite society. For goodness sake, his father Zachariah was a priest, and along with his wife, wife Elizabeth, were upstanding citizens. John was out in the wilds, not caring what people thought, or at least he didn't let what other people thought stop him from harshly proclaiming a baptism of repentance, to be followed by a life that bore fruit worthy of repentance. John demanded of those who came to be baptized a sincere resolution to reform their life. Those who simply came to see and gawk, to get a selfie with the passionate windswept John, or to capture a video or a blip for the social media frenzy that would take place today, with hashtags like crazy prophet, voices in the wilderness, hashtag camel's hair, locusts and wild honey, hashtag you brood of vipers. <laughs> John vehemently confronted this group and he called them names accused them of false pretenses, and more or less told them they could go to hell by saying, but the chaff you will burn with inquenchable fire. John, who was labeled eccentric and indignant, claimed to be a mere shadow of the baptizer to come, of Jesus. Terrified. John was wild with the urgency for conversion, high with the urgency for people to prepare for the coming of Christ, ferocious with an urgency to be awake for the end of time. There is no headline that could sanitize John the Baptist and his work in the desert of Judea. There's no headline that could make John's message palatable. Repent, for the reign of God is at hand. There's no headline that could twist the words into something comfortable. John's message is harsh, direct, and painful. Think of the images that we heard in the text. It is painful to make roads straight. If any of you have been on Highway 3 over the past year and witnessed the dynamiting of bedrock, the crushing of stone, the spreading of gravel to make new highway, it's been hard, dirty, and time-consuming work. It's painful to wear camel's hair. If you have ever worn something that is wool and it has made you itch, or it gets wet and you smell like farm, you know it is painful. It is painful to be called names, you brood of vipers, to have one's ego knocked down. You're not so great. God can make children of Abraham out of these rocks. It's painful if you are a tree to be cut down or for some people to watch trees being cut down for no reason. It's painful to think of baptism with fire rather than water, to consider judgment and purification in the process. It's painful to think about death, our death, the death of loved ones. Where do we go? Where do they go? Is it just a metaphor, or is there really unquenchable fire? John the hippie, I mean, baptizer is in the desert proclaiming repent 
for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is both frightening and exhilarating. Welcome to the tension of Advent. The tension of Advent is evident in the scripture. The prophet Isaiah began his words this morning with images of judgment, striking the ruthless and slaying the wicked. In turn, the poor and afflicted receive justice. When Isaiah, in a very non-John the Baptist way, created a beautiful piece of poetry, not to frighten us into repentance, but to draw the hearer's heart into an exhilarated moment of believing the possibility of a peaceable kingdom. The wolf and the lamb will lie down together. The leopard and the goat sit side by side. The calf and the lion will graze together with the child guiding them. Lion and ox will eat hay together. And children playing in the dens of snakes will not get hurt. This comfortable poem is an indirect way to weave into a human heart a truth that is not heard in the surrounding world. The story is very serious. Although couched in comfort, the poem describes earth-shattering change, an upheaval of the natural order. As John the Baptist's story indicates, this kind of change is painful. Isaiah describes a change in the very nature of the animals. None of the animals of the pole are acting in the way they were created to act in order to survive. They're not living by their animal instinct. Fear, protection, preservation have all dissipated, have vanished. The subtle idea being planted is the hope, the possibility that if animal nature can so drastically change, so too can human nature. Imagine human beings drastically changed, turning from a proclivity to live to our shadow side. Fear, self-protection, self-preservation dissipated. Jealousy, anger, coveting, vengeance, judgment, bullying, lust, vanish, gone. Isaiah painted for us a picture of John the Baptist's families in the wilderness. Repent for the reign of God has come here. When come in its fullness, it is a complete change of nature. Frightening and exhilarating. In the early 1800s, there was a Quaker minister named Edward Hicks. He was captivated by this chapter of Isaiah. Over a lifetime, he painted more than 62 works of this prophecy, and they were called the Peaceable Kingdom. His early works had delightful animals, lions, leopards, cows, ox, sheep, goats, snakes, and little children all happy, content, serene, playing together, and filled with hope. In the pictures, there were often groupings of people, sometimes Quaker siblings, numerous examples that included prominently placed people from the Lenape First Nation. Edward was deliberate in the inclusion of the Lenape, who illustrated his sense of reconciliation and the Quaker practice the values of friendship and love which Christ came to teach humans. This relationship reminder was to direct people to honor a treaty that was made 200 years before, a treaty of perpetual friendship signed with Pennsylvania's founder, William Penn, a treaty that after his time had been disregarded. The Quakers of Bruce Goose Creek, later Lincoln, Virginia, acted like John in the wilderness, anti-establishment, creating a different vision of the world. Before the American Civil War, they publicly acted and spoke out against slavery. Official written documents included an acknowledgement of the women friends who took part in the collective voice. 
and they took on an anti-war stance and declared themselves conscientious objectors. They practiced pacifism, showing kindness and courage. Hicks returned again and again to the peaceable kingdom because it was an expression of the Quaker understanding of the inner light, which referred to an understanding that salvation could be attained when one yielded their will to the God within, to the Christ within. Isaiah expressed the idea in the breaking down of barriers so that one could see that you could live and work together in peace. Unfortunately, Edward's art caused trouble. He was a bit of a John the Baptist to even create art. Quakers were a society of friends who shied away from any sort of ornamentation in their meeting halls and in their homes. Edward was between a rock and a hard spot, for this is how he bought bread for his family. He fed his children of five with money he made from painting. In the early years, Edward had hoped that humankind would establish peace on earth by exercising biblical Christ-like principles, that others would join Quakers in a brief year of the kingdom of God. But as the years went on, Edward became more cynical about human beings' abilities, and the animals in his peaceable kingdom became tense, exhausted, tired-looking, sometimes showing their teeth. And the last paintings had animals, like leopards, depicted fighting each other. Edward was disappointed that God's kingdom would never be a reality in its fullness. And in this, he lost hope. He did turn fervently to Christ, for that's where his hope was. Advent 2 traditionally lights the candle of peace. Edward wrestled with the tension of the Advent season, this idea of a peaceable kingdom, Christ's kingdom now, but not yet. Isaiah offered a call to inspire us to attain, to contribute to the peaceable kingdom, to draw humankind to the possibility that humankind can change, be different, live peace. John the Baptist, with no holds barred, demanded demands. Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. The reign of God is at hand. Frightened and exhilarated, we are to go this week to wrestle with the tension of what currently is and what, if we turn our will to the Christ within, is a promised possibility.